I'd like to talk to you today about biodiversity and with a heavy emphasis on conservation of biodiversity. Um, but let me start by just talking a little bit about what we mean by biodiversity first. Um, you all have an intuitive idea of it, but uh, um, probably the most fundamental way to look at it is the number of species that we have uh, on Earth. And we define a species um, as a group of individuals that, don't, that uh, interbreed with each other but don't breed with anything else. Now there's lots of sort of crossing of margins there. Um, uh, some species will produce some hybrids for a while, but then the hybrids die out. We would call those two species. Um, there are also species which vary a great deal over their range. And uh, you know our familiar song sparrow here, um, when you get to the deserts out west, they look very pale and you'd hardly recognize them as song sparrows. When you get to the dense forests up in the uh, um, in Western North America, British Columbia, uh, they're very dark and big and you'd hardly recognize them, but we do call them one whole species because uh, you can trace a link between all these different populations of song sparrows and we say that is a species. Now, um, so a species has a nice kind of uh, biological definition. Um, the, um, there are other levels of looking at biodiversity. You can look at the level of families of things. You can look at the level of, um, of higher order groups like what we call phyla or divisions. Uh, you know, a phylum is all of us vertebrates, for instance, or all of the bugs. And uh, um, those constructs, though, are all kind of artificial. Uh, in the sense that they're invented by scientists. There isn't a nice biological basis for them that we have for species. Um, this becomes important, by the way, um, because if we want to preserve things, you really need to define what the diversity is. And so uh, species is probably the, one of the best ways to do it. But I might point out also that there are sort of species and species. There, there are species that are very similar to each other, but then there's sort of some rather unique species. Um, one that, um, that comes to mind is the coelacanth. A coelacanth is actually the very closely related to the ancestors of organisms that first crawled on land. And everyone thought that until um, a number of years ago that they uh, became extinct about 60 million years ago. And then suddenly someone found some off the coast of South Africa uh, near the Comoro Islands. And to this day they're not very well known, but we know they exist. And uh, so that's kind of a rather special species. Another example is there's a lizard on uh, New Zealand which is only found there called the tuatera. And you'd kind of look at it and you'd say, oh, it's a lizard. Um, but it um, turns out it's not. It's actually a whole separate group of reptiles. Um, and so, uh, uh, so that's kind of a special species too. So my point is just that there are, uh, that some species are truly rather unique and others perhaps aren't quite so unique. All of this becomes important, if, particularly if you want to do some legislation defining what biodiversity is. You want to know what the value of things are. Um, okay, I might sort of say there's, uh, species have different importance, and I always put that in quotes, because importance, who are we to define what's important in the, in the um, natural ecosystems? But some apparently do have higher importance. Uh, one example that many of you are familiar with are beavers. Uh, beavers um, are what we call a keystone species. And again, that's not a rigid definition. Some species are more keystone, some are less keystone. But a keystone means, is an, an analogy to the kind of stones, you know, the keystone in the middle of an arch. Uh, that is what holds the arch up. And that's the idea of a keystone species, is that it really is the basis for the welfare of a lot of other species. Beavers um, encourage muskrats. Um, 
They eat aspens, which means that they, um, uh, there will be new regrowth of aspens, which encourages deer. Um, the muskrats encourage the presence of, uh, of minks. And, um, uh, and there's all sorts of other interrelations that are dependent upon beavers. So we call beavers a keystone species. So you might say that's a particularly important species in an environment. Although once again, that's just as far as we know about those sort of things. Um, okay, uh, species are certainly important when we talk about biodiversity. Um, but also there are different organisms in different habitats or what we would call communities or ecosystems. All you need to do is think about sort of a forest versus a swamp versus a grassland. Those are different uh, communities. And um, in as much as they usually have different species, but one thing that we would like to do is preserve these kind of communities as well. Just as an example, um, long grass prairies which it used to occupy a swathe from um, north-south swathe in North America, sort of starting up in um, Illinois, uh, going down through Iowa and uh, Indiana, going south down through there uh, to um, practice my geography, Missouri and uh, uh, Arkansas around there. Um, that uh, community has sort of 98% disappeared. Uh, why? It's very valuable for agriculture. So um, actually efforts are being made to preserve some of this community, but it's extremely small and fragmented. So um, when we talk about biodiversity, we want to keep representatives of these different communities as well. And I'll talk a little later about the Endangered Species Act and indicate that that's one lapse in, in our conservation efforts is the fact that the Endangered Species Act takes uh, very little account of different communities or habitats. And an interesting question is just how many species there are in the world. First of all, let us say that not the brightest biologists know how many that is. Until uh, about uh, 25 years ago, we thought, oh well, there is a, something in the range of two to three million species. And by the way, this is all based, you know what biologists do is they uh, describe species and they describe them in fair detail and publish it and that becomes establishment of a known species. Um, we've done that for birds. Um, pretty much we know most of the species of birds. We know most of the species, actually most of the species of plants, believe it or not. But when you get to things like insects, we know considerably less, and we know we know considerably less. I'll describe why in a minute. And when it gets to things like bacteria, we really turns out we have very little idea of the diversity there. Let me just take the insects for a moment. Uh, about 25 years ago, a guy named Terry Irwin, Irwin um, decided he was going to investigate what, was, what kind of insects were up in the canopy of the rainforest. You know, us little pedestrian humans had walked around under these great big trees and identified a lot of things around the base of the trees, but we didn't get much up into the canopy to see what was up there. So he adopted a rather, um, uh, rather brutal and crude technique. He simply got a great big fogger with insecticides. Pyrethrums, by the way, nothing too dangerous to people but nasty for insects, and just put big cloths on the floor and collected all the insects that came raining down. Uh, he found such a wide diversity of uh, things that were totally undescribed that he did some sort of um, what we call paper napkin or toilet paper calculations. You know, you sit there in the restaurant, you say, oh, gee, I found this and this must be true. Anyway, he came up with the fact that there's probably many, many more species of undescribed insects than we imagined. And he estimated between 10 and 30 million. So these days we say there's probably 15 million or of that order. Uh, species out there, of which we do know that 1.5 million have been described, as I mentioned a bit earlier. So there is a huge diversity out there that we don't know about. Particularly in a lot of the hot spots, as we say, for diversity. Uh, 
probably you know that one of the major hotspots for diversity are the tropical wet forests or rainforests, and um, that's certainly one of them. Um, the density of, of uh, species there and diversity within relatively small areas is truly phenomenal. Uh, if you go out and walk around a square mile up here um, in the forests and look for trees, you probably could come up with 15 at least, maybe 20, and in other areas of the U.S. maybe up to about 25. But if you go down to the tropics, believe it or not, in one hectare, which is uh, 2.5 acres, a very small part of a, um, of a square mile, uh, you can find two to 300 species of trees. Uh, so the diversity is extraordinary, and there's a very interesting discussion about just why is there all this diversity there? And um, part of it I might mention is just that these, and let me mention the other major hot spot, are coral reefs. Um, I'll let D'Amico tell you about coral reefs, um, but uh, coral reefs are, are, uh, have very high, di high diversity. Um, and of course, they're even more threatened, I would say, than tropical forests. They're really in deep trouble now because of warming of the oceans. But I'll, as I say, I'll let him talk about that. By the way, one of the paradoxes about tropical wet forests and coral reefs is that actually the basic nutrients in the environment, you think, oh, it must be very rich, you know, all kinds of nutrients supporting all this diversity. They're pretty poor. Tropi open tropical oceans are much less rich than, say, the North Atlantic or the North Pacific. Um, rainforest soils are typically so poor that if you c completely eliminate the rainforest, um, you know, cut it down, burn it, and you'll get some regrowth coming up in that. But if you cut that again, it will be virtually sterile. And we haven't done too many of these experiments, fortunately, but it will probably not regenerate in a very long time. The reason is simply all of the nutrients are apparently in both coral reefs and tropical wet forests are uh, bound up in the living system. And they're circulating through the living system, you know, the insects that eat the leaves, the birds that eat the insects, and so forth. And it's sort of this basic richness of diversity that's built up over a long evolutionary period, which supports the diversity of insects, the diversity of birds. So um, um, there is that paradox that, uh, that uh, tropical environments are frequently rather nutrient poor, but they support this enormous richness. But what that does suggest, of course, is that if you remove the richness, you've got a very poor uh, environment left behind. Okay, let me talk a little bit about uh, extinction because that's what uh, what we're facing with uh, uh, with biodiversity. And let me say at the outset that of course the biodiver the diversity of organisms has increased through the history of the Earth. Obviously, it started somewhere and it's gotten a lot more. Um, general notion is that it's sort of increased throughout geological history. And by the way, we're talking about three and a half million years or so. Sorry, billion years. So it's been a long time. There evidently, we have discovered relatively recently that there have been major extinctions occurring in the past. At the end of the um, Cretaceous period, about 65 million years ago, um, there was a major event uh, it was, by the way, when the dinosaurs finally disappeared, but it wasn't like all the dinosaurs disappeared then. They, a lot of them disappeared a bit earlier. Um, but that seemed to be the sort of coup de grace for the uh, dinosaurs. And we now are pretty sure that what happened 65 million years ago was a major impact of a, of a meteorite or an asteroid, whatever you want to call it, uh, at that size range, which impacted off the Yucatan coast of Mexico and uh, blasted the Earth. And um, exactly what happened there, uh, we don't know, but it probably had a major effect on climate, and that might have led to a period of intense warming. I don't know, Alan, do you have any ideas on that? or? <laughs> No, but I'm not quite sure what they say were the climatic consequences, but that did definitely 
uh, result in a significant <laughs> extinction event then. Actually, there was a much bigger one 250 million years ago, and we don't know what happened there, either a big asteroid impact or volcanic, uh, massive volcanic eruptions. Um, but somewhere between 77 and 96 percent of marine species became extinct there, and apparently pretty cataclysmically, pretty suddenly. Although, you know, suddenly in the fossil record, maybe 100,000 years, so. Uh. Okay, so what are we facing now? We are facing um, certainly an extinction event now. A lot of people look around and say, well, how many species of birds have we lost from the United States in the last, um, uh, you know, a couple of hundred years? And you might say, oh, well, that's just a handful. And by the way, let's exclude Hawaii, because I'll talk a little more about Hawaii, but that's a sort of special case. Um, we probably have, we have only lost a handful. But if you plot that on a geological time scale, and you say, well, if we keep losing a handful of species every 100 years or 200 years, um, that's going to amount to a major extinction event. Um, so, um, all I'm saying is people will say to you, oh, but we've had extinctions on Earth before. Yeah, we have. Um, but don't call what's happening now not an extinction event. It is an extinction event. doesn't mean everything's disappearing. You hear lots about songbirds declining. It really is only certain songbirds. Other songbirds are apparently doing all right. But um, I'll talk a bit more about that later. I thought I would sort of talk about a couple of case studies of extinction and then get at the root causes of extinction. What, what is happening that's causing a loss of biodiversity? This is actually a famous painting by a, a, an internationally known wildlife artist who lived in Ithaca. I don't know, Louis Agassi Fuertes. And by the way, the Lab of Ornithology has a beautiful room with all his paintings around it. But, um, Anyway, this is a picture of a peregrine falcon um, on a ledge, uh, very much like the Taganic Gorge near Ithaca. And uh, I think a lot of you know the story of the peregrine falcon. The eastern race actually became extinct 30 years ago or so because of the impact of DDT. Um, DDT accumulated in the food chains, and I don't have time to get into all that, but what it meant is that the ducks that the peregrines were eating had high levels of DDT and they were getting that concentrated in their system and um, they simply didn't breed. What it caused is um, the thickness of their eggshells decreased to the point that they were just always uh, squashing their eggs, literally. And uh, same thing happened with bald eagles, not quite so severely, but almost. Happily, the peregrine, of course, has come back, but actually that's been as a result of millions of dollars of effort and on the part of um, various agencies. And of course, we're happy to say that there's a pair of peregrines resident and have been for 10 years now in downtown Binghamton. They've adapted nicely to the, uh, to the human environment. Instead of nesting on cliffs, they nest on ledges on buildings. But it's Good idea because the pigeon population is just great. In fact, peregrines never used to stay up here during the winter, but you got all these pigeons around, why not spend the winter here too? So that's what they do. So this bird, be, uh, actually the Eastern race, the ones that we've used to repopulate the East actually are, actually I'm not sure whether they're a Western or the Arctic race. I think they're the Western race, but uh, anyway, um, they did become extinct because of pollution. Let me talk about another one first, okay? <laughs> this is my slide of the ivory-billed woodpecker, okay? <laughs> um, actually, that has a very interesting history. Um, and by the way, the reason I have this shirt is um, uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology announced three or four years ago that they had found it again. It had been presumed extinct. Um, we know quite well why it became extinct. Uh, it was an inhabitant of bottomland forests. Um, all along the southern U.S. and actually up the eastern seaboard too, um, but specifically river bottomlands is what I mean, where there were, you know, great big huge trees. Um, but their specialization is what actually led to their extinction. 
they specialized actually in very freshly dead trees. And instead of pecking in like this, the way you think most woodpeckers do, they actually slabbed off bark like that. And they would only do it with relatively freshly dead ones because the other woodpeckers would get the rest of the stuff in the actual wood of the tree. But they could slab off these bark. Now, to have a sufficient number of bark of trees in this freshly dead condition, you first of all need a very mature forest where trees are dying off naturally. And um, in order to sustain this, they actually had huge home ranges. Uh, one pair of woodpeckers needed about six square miles or so uh, to support their livelihood. And it's simply that all these bottomlands had gorgeously valuable trees in them and they were all logged. And the last significant tract that was logged was in the night, late, actually it was in the Second World War, and a fellow from Cornell just before that went down and studied them in this plot in Louisiana and figured out all this stuff, but it was too late to save the plot, or people weren't interested in doing that in the Second World War. So, um, so that last plot got hacked down. Um, there had been some reports of them subsequently, but most were unverified. Uh, but then Cornell did announce that they had found it again. Uh, it's had a very controversial time in the last few years because nobody can produce a really good picture of one or a good uh, recording of one in spite of all wonderful techniques and a huge investment by the Lab of Ornithology and other people to actually get a record. But they do say they've seen one. Anyway, my point here is in terms of extinction, um, it was habitat loss very clearly. Uh, that what a specific habitat lo loss, namely uh, mature old growth, we call them, uh, bottomland forests. And they were previously fairly abundant. Otapon didn't consider them a rare bird. Okay, I said I'd say a little bit about Hawaii. Hawaii is shown diagrammatically here as these islands. You will know they're a set of islands. Islands actually are particularly vulnerable to extinction. The Hawaiian Islands are about the most isolated group of islands in, on Earth. They're 2,000 miles from the nearest landmass of any size at all, and they've come up right out of the ocean. You know, the volcanoes came right up out of the ocean. So they didn't have anything. There hasn't been anything there um, in the sense that, uh, that they were ever connected to a mainland. Um, actually, the older the, the islands actually extend all the way up here as a set of atolls or very small uh, islands um, that are older, actually, and that's all a very interesting story. The youngest one is the big island here of Hawaii. Anyway, apparently a population of uh, something ancestral to these birds reached there and then underwent a process that we call adaptive radiation. They found islands where there was nobody there and that's a great find for any kind of animal, including us. And uh, so they, what they did is they diversified. And I won't go into how all that happens, but they achieved a very considerable diversity. Um, probably the ancestral type was something like this one here, a nectar feeder. Um, but then there's um, uh, this one here, which actually obviously had a very specialized bill for certain kinds of flowers. Um, this one here, which is actually, there's two birds left, just two individuals, the po'o uli. Um, it, pardon? One male, one female, we hope. They don't know. <laughs> the sexes are very similar, but um, they're not gonna touch them because there were three and they brought one in and it died. So, um, but anyway, this guy feeds on snails, okay? And then this one here picks, has a, obviously a big thick bill for picking apart bark. So these have diversified extensively. Now, if you look at the biodiversity now of the Hawaiian Islands, you would actually say it's richer than it was 100 or 150 years ago because all sorts of things have been imported. Everyone wanted a cardinal, they wanted a crow, they wanted this, that. And so they brought them in. And what's happened is um, 
Partly they've been responsible for forcing these birds out of their natural habitat. It's actually a pretty complicated story. Agriculture's had a role. Actually, the major thing that's had a major impact is island organisms typically don't have very good defenses against um, diseases or predators because uh, they never had to face that. The, one of the major killers here has actually been um, avian malaria, which was brought in when people brought mosquitoes in. They didn't bring them in intentionally, but boats came in and dumped their water and that introduced mosquitoes. Um, also, um, the rats were brought in, and rats are pretty bad, and then people brought in cats to catch the rats, and mongooses to catch the cats to catch the rats. No, not quite, but they <laughs> did bring in mongooses and cats. And um, they've had a major impact. People brought in goats and um, pigs. Pardon? The brown snake. That's not there yet in Hawaii, thank God, but that's a major uh, that will finish a lot of these species off if that gets in. That's in Guam. And they very carefully inspect planes coming into uh, Hawaii from Guam. Um, this is actually just a plate of these birds, and I just put this up because this is extinct, this is extinct, this is extinct, this is still alive. Um, this one's still alive, only 2,500 species, uh, individuals, um, and so forth. It's, it's a checkerboard. Some have survived. A couple of species are actually doing pretty well, um, but uh, most of them are, uh, are either highly endangered or actually gone. This is one cute one, obviously a lovely one that's pretty threatened. It cannot tolerate any kind of avian malaria, and, uh, um, and there are not very many individuals left. There's even fewer left of this one. This is the Maui parrot bill and has this neat bill for picking stuff out of bark and getting insects. Only 500 individuals of this one left. Did the ones that survived figure out how to deal with avian malaria? What happened? Yeah, actually, uh, one of those ones I showed you on a previous slide actually does seem to be more resistant to it. And finally, just because uh, this is, oh, this is the kind of forest these birds are now restricted to. Turns out they occurred much more generally earlier, but um, turns out that, they, uh, that the mosquitoes don't like high altitudes. So all of these rare birds are now up at the higher altitudes, which wasn't their original environment probably, but uh, they've had to move up to this area to survive at all. That's why that bright red one I showed you a, few minutes ago is surviving because it's moved up to this high altitude. And um, this is actually a picture of some of the things they use in Hawaii. This is um, rat poison. Um, somewhere in here there's a cat, oh here it is, there's a cat trap. And you probably don't like the idea of catching cats, sorry Lee. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, cats just in this kind of environment turn into major predators. You know, they can climb trees, they can raid nests and so forth. Uh, actually, this is the cat trap. This is a have a heart cap trap. And I think this was a snare for pigs. So, you know, this is the kind of effort government is putting out in uh, these Hawaiian environments to try and control and lead to some of the survival of these uh, species. And finally, one plant that's been widely threatened by goats in particular is the famous silver sword. Um, this occurs on recent um, cinder areas around volcanoes, gorgeous plant. And uh, it was almost eradicated until they fenced some of the national parks there to uh, keep out um, goats. So let me just summarize and um, Maybe I'll do that in just the form of what we think are the major causes of loss. And um, I think probably fair to say the major cause of, of loss of biodiversity is habitat loss. And it doesn't take you know, a lot of imagination to realize what's happening if we carve up the countryside and, uh, and eliminate a lot of, of wetlands have been eliminated. 50% of the wetlands in the U.S. have disappeared. Um, and um, actually, I know from just local explorations that there's hardly a pond or marshy pond around here that hasn't been dammed at some point and stocked with uh, usually exotic fish. 
obviously that has uh, impacts. Do you realize that there are, we have lovely forests around here and that's great, but 99% uh, of them have been logged. There's, there's just a very few left that are really untouched. Fortunately, forests grow up nicely here. Unlike the tropics, they grow, uh, they grow, they recover pretty well. But there aren't a lot of very old trees here, and certainly no very old intact forests. That's why we went after the IBM Glen because that actually contains a nice, uh, the very steep uh, banks of that ravine contain some truly old growth trees, uh, 400 year hemlocks and that kind of thing. But there aren't many of those around here. So habitat loss is a biggie. And uh, as I demonstrated for the Hawaiian Islands, um, exotic pests have been a, um, exotic organisms like the avian malaria, another one called avian pox, and then all the goats, pigs, rats, etc., have had major impacts. Even here, um, not so much in the form of larger animals, but diseases. Uh, Chestnuts were a major part of our forests, not just giving us chestnuts, but they were you know, very valuable lumber, etc. Uh, a century ago, we had a fungus invade, and um, that wiped out all the chestnuts. We've had a beech disease come through that's uh, carried by a little um, woolly aphid. And uh, that's eliminated almost all of the big beaches around here. I'm afraid the hemlocks, which I truly treasure, are threatened by a little bug that uh, is now widespread a little bit south of here called the woolly adelgid, um, which simply eats the hemlock. Doesn't have any diseases, but eats the hemlock. And uh, most of these have come from overseas somewhere, although some of them have uh, sort of undergone adaptations. I'm not quite sure actually where the woolly adelgid comes from, but. There's a number of others that, um, that have invaded that threaten some of our local <laughs> trees. So exotic organisms are probably the second major. Uh, surprisingly enough, you know, direct killing has really been a major cause. It has in some cases. It was a contributing cause to the death of the, pa the extinction of the passenger pigeons. Passenger pigeons were described as sort of filling the skies a hundred years ago, um, but they were large, they were shot, actually more than a hundred, 150. They were shot for the market. Turns out that's not the only cause. They had a lifestyle that I don't really have time to go into that was probably cause of their demise too. But it was certainly massive market, shooting for the market that, um, that certainly contributed to their decline. Um, and of course, in the case of the oceans, as Dick mentioned, uh, these major fisheries have all declined, um, largely because of direct fishing, but probably still habitat loss and invasion by exotic diseases and uh, other organisms has been a, a more important cause. And as I mentioned for the peregrine, pollution has been a problem. Um, that's been a problem, say, for oysters in um, Chesapeake Bay. There's now probably 1% of the population of oysters that there was 100 years ago in Chesapeake Bay, largely because of siltation. Uh, silt coming down the, the Susquehanna River and ending up in, the, um, in uh, Chesapeake Bay, which kills uh, the plants, which uh, eventually leads to the disappearance of the oysters. And that was a major fishery. So they're, they've, they're talk, talking, actually the Chesapeake Bay is a focus of a marvelous sort of restoration effort, but it's an uphill battle. Uh, now that everyone wants to grow corn for biofuels, corn unfortunately has a lot more runoff in terms of nitrates, silt, and um, other things which uh, are reversing some of the efforts to sort of restore the Chesapeake now. Okay, let me just finish up by saying, uh, what do we want to do about all this? <laughs> um, first of all, obviously we want to uh, preserve habitats. I said that was the major loss. We want to preserve habitats. Um, you might think, well, we got all these parks. Well, uh, some people uh, talk about parks as sort of rock and ice biomes. In other words, there was no other use for it, so we put it into a park. Um, 
But um, but there are some wildlife parks. Everglades was actually the first park that was established as dedicated mainly to wildlife. Of course, that's a pretty tortured story too, because yes. the Everglades have been denied a lot of water. But uh, I won't get into that. Um, but anyway, my point is parks are a little, they're sort of almost happenstance. Somebody wanted to give it or it was the land wasn't much use. So they certainly don't equate with where the best wildlife or where important wildlife is. Um, I've actually been doing a local inventory of natural areas and I've been doing parks but I've also been doing some private areas and uh, there's actually a number of rather nice private areas here. A bog that I discovered just last fall and a, um, and a marvelous uh, ravine um, at the very north end of the county that has some really nice stuff in it. Not stuff that's sort of uh, uh, even perhaps critically endangered everywhere. It's, but uh, they're sort of rare environments here. And they're in private hands, which means anything can happen. And so, um, so uh, habitat is an important thing to preserve. Um, we are blessed in the United States by having the Endangered Species Act. There isn't much equivalent anywhere else in the world. Um, the Endangered Species Act, as you know, sort of means that endangered species cannot be harmed. It also mandates that a recovery plan be set up, and that's what happened with the peregrine falcon. Is, uh, um, actually, efforts preceded that, but uh, they were certainly helped a lot by the Endangered Species Act. It, it demands a recovery plan. There's a couple problems, as many of you know, there's sort of political problems there. Uh, you have to get things listed as endangered. And that um, takes time, and um, we can just get, I'm afraid, one more dig in at the last administration. Their rate of adding endangered species was about one quarter or less than in previous administrations. So um, they obviously weren't processing things very fast. There's also the problem, the Endangered Species Act, as I say, is great, but um, it doesn't specifically protect habitats. And if we're talking about s protecting, say, bogs, you've got to have an endangered species there if you want to, uh, um, if you want to raise the uh, action of the uh, Endangered Species Act. So there's been a lot of talk about modifying it. Of course, the Endangered Species Act expires periodically and it's been threatened every time it's been expired by the usual kind of interests that would not like to see uh, species or to have government regulation over any particular habitats. Um, so we can work for that. Um, we can also work for local protection. I think it's important not to just say, oh, the federal government's doing this or even the state government's doing this, but we can actually do things locally like protect IBM Glenn and uh, work on that. By the way, I think IBM was not a, a big bad bogey. I think they, they simply didn't know that they had a, uh, a really nice Glen there. And they said, well, we're moving out of here. We're, you know, we don't have any use for the country club anymore. We're going to sell it. And before we sell it, we're going to log it because we can get some more money out of it. And I think that was just probably their, their notion. Um, and it was because it was on private land. It hadn't been inventoried as a, as a unit of nice uh, uh, natural value. Is the, is the restoration project in the Chesapeake Bay area supported by the Endangered Species Act? In What's the nature of the funding? Is it a federally um, funded initiative or is it a combination federal state? Um, it's actually a combination of everything. There's a lot of volunteer effort being done down there, but there's also state efforts. Actually, Delaware, Maryland, and um, Virginia and Pennsylvania are all collaborating together in an alliance to help. But, you know, that's one part of the government, right? There are other parts of the government that want to do other things, like encourage uh, logging or biofuels or fishing or whatever. So. Uh, a comment and then a question. Yeah. With respect to the oysters in Chesapeake Bay, I'm reminded, I believe this to be true. 100 years ago, the number of oysters in the bay filtered all of the water in the bay in one day. 
today it takes one year for the oysters. Yep. And it's not that the bay has gotten bigger, it's that the oyster population has gotten yeah. smaller. My question is, how does the significant reduction in the number of species, how does that affect human welfare? Yep. Okay, I was just going to sort of get to that. Um, uh, yeah, maybe I sort of skipped over that. I sort of need to say why we want to preserve things. There are a lot of sort of useful human things we can get out of. Uh, I think probably many of you have heard the story of sort of uh, the cancer drug from Madagascar and the uh, breast cancer drug from Pacific U. Um, that uh, turn out to be valuable pharmaceuticals. Turns out you can't push that too far. Uh, various people have said, oh, the Amazon must be full of things. Well, maybe, it, maybe there's more there that certainly we don't know about, but various people have tried to exploit that and it hasn't really been a, an, an amazing success. But there's other sort of more obviously useful things, uh, certain tropical hardwoods, uh, um, anyway, there are use, things of direct use to us we can get out, out of that. There's also the whole eco-services, ecoser, ecosystem services, sorry. What we're talking about there is things like, um, uh, it is predicted that if the Amazon is more or less completely deforested, that it will have a very dramatic effect on tropical climates because a lot of water evaporates and then falls again. Um, most of that water is probably going to end up in the ocean if the Amazon forest is uh, deforested. And um, believe it or not, they're actually predicting that there will be desert areas um, in the Amazon basin. Um, if um, not the whole thing is a desert, but a lot of it will be much drier. And um, that will, may have a major consequence on worldwide climate. Um, and there's all sorts of other things, like preserving swamps and bogs, uh, particularly actually uh, riverside swamps and those kind of things actually play a major role in filtering out pollution, flood control, we all know about the idea there, and if it doesn't always happen. Um, but there are all of these, and then there's this, of course, the major one, big one, is uh, carbon dioxide fixation. Um, because of global warming. We need to keep our forest to keep that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And so um, that's ecosystem services. I would just make the final argument that, um, that uh, has been articulated by E.O. Wilson very nicely. He says of all the sort of things we're doing to our environment, the thing that our children's children will least forgive us for is the loss of biodiversity. Um, and I could just argue that, you know, this biodiversity has been crafted by billions of years of evolution, and it's simply marvelous the kind of intricate adaptations that organisms show. And to eliminate it is kind of like saying, well, we can do without uh, Degas, Monet, Mon Monet, we'll keep Renoir, but, uh, you know, maybe we'll throw away uh, the rest of them. It's sort of like a museum, and you don't want to throw away your treasures. Also, I think even more uh, um, uh, fundamental is just that if, for example, the oceans are, are um, polluted, yes. the, most of the oxygen that feeds uh, us in, in the planet comes from the oceans. So if the oceans are destroyed, then there won't be any life possible on the, on the Earth. So that's, I mean, well, very that's true to a certain extent. It turns out there's actually so much oxygen in the atmosphere that it would take a very long time to deplete it significantly. It's much more carbon dioxide yeah. that's the worry, but uh, yeah, Chris. There, there are some other ways in which you know um, biodiversity and preserving what is there uh, directly impacts human human life, and that is that a lot of our natural products that come from the living plants or the things that that you know we use, you know, if for example with habitat loss or uh, destruction by invasive species, those things are gone. Mm -hmm. You know, our, our fishing industry, um, our forest the product industry, I mean, there are a lot of these things that could be affected by forest pests, you know, the fish diseases that are coming in and down with water and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So these have a direct economic impact here. Yeah. Yeah, good, thanks. <laughs>
Sure. I just want to know if you consider the Norway spruce and the Norway maple <laughs> treasures. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Norway maple is uh, it's actually a nice tree. Yeah. I don't think. I don't hold any grudges against it. It is a bit invasive, not a whole lot right here, but I've seen places where it's invasive. And it would be displacing native trees. Norway spruce uh, doesn't, as far as I know, it's not invasive very much. You see a little bit self-seeding, but not very much. And, uh, but Norway maple is overplanted too. If we had a major maple, Norway maple disease, it would be without a lot of city shade trees. Isn't the most important impact the, on our life support system like the pollution of our air, water, and, and soil? That's what I sort of meant by ecosystem right. service is a rather yeah. grand word, but it means yeah. all of those yeah. things and what, to some extent what Chris was talking about. Yeah. George? Yeah. Yeah. Could, could you say a few words about the deer and squirrel population? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to mention that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, the deer are uh, overpopulated fairly simply because there isn't a top predator around. When wolves were here, uh, they did control uh, deer populations. Of course, they derived some protection from no shooting within the city. And I love it the way the deer hang out in the forests all day long, and then at night they march out into the suburbs and eat, eat everything that's there. Uh, but. Um, uh, yeah, I've actually documented, and I really mean documented, uh, the disappearance of several species of wildflowers from the university uh, preserve, which are, you know, I don't know that the deer did it, but they're the most logical candidate. Several trilliums that we used to have there. Um, the, uh, um, um, a, a couple of types of, of lily family plants. They seem to like those have all disappeared from campus. And I know they were there in 1996, but they're not there now. And in good numbers, some of them in good numbers too. So, about squirrels. Uh, I'm not quite sure why squirrels are so abundant, but, um, well, I might say a little more about the top predator idea too. You know, some people think, well, top predator, that doesn't really control things. But actually, Yellowstone's provided a very nice example of that. Wolves have reinvaded Yellowstone. And by the way, some were introduced, but they actually got there partially by themselves, too. And they built up a significant population there. And the elks are actually doing some very different things now. They're not grazing in open, um, open uh, bottomland <coughs> fields where they used to. Um, and their numbers have gone down as a result of so top predators do control populations. It's also increased the richness of some of the, the flora in Yellowstone, has it not? I think so, yeah. I wasn't aware of that. But. Julie, what was, a, as I understood it, a problem with frogs? Oh, yeah. <laughs> to mention everything that you covered. Yeah. <laughs> Could you cover frogs? Frogs are, yeah. just, <laughs> they seem to be particularly sensitive because Wetlands are particularly vulnerable to exploitation. They're vulnerable to pollution. Let me tell you about this little guy, though. This guy is called the golden toad. It existed in one mountain range in Costa Rica, where it was pretty abundant. They came out every spring to breed in little ponds. The male turns bright gold, and it's become the kind of moniker of uh, Costa Rican conservation. Um, it was really abundant breeding in pools. It disappeared in 1989. Actually, there were very few left in 1989 after a great big year in 87. Um, and people thought, well, maybe they only come out every few years, but it's never reappeared. They'd never seen them again. And um, it turns out that what's happening there is a couple of things. And we're not sure what it is. It's often very hard to track what causes the demise of something. But the cloud forest has been documented to be getting drier. They had a dry season in 1989, and they never reappeared. But it turns out they discovered recently that there's a kind of fungus that's been invading and causing extinctions of all sorts of frogs in Central America, and um, called a chytrid fungus. 
And uh, they think now that might have been a major contributor to its extinction. So that's just a, that's one reason frogs are so sensitive is uh, their habitat is so vulnerable. Um, but they also are pretty sensitive to diseases. Um, turns out they think the reason mm -hmm. for uh, great scarcity of some frogs and toads up in the um, Pacific coast is because of excessive UV irradiation. So, um, and the, uh, the embryos or the tadpoles, I forget which, are very sensitive to UV. So, um, but uh, yeah, often frogs are considered the kind of bellwethers of, uh, of habitat, um, habitat integrity just because they are so sensitive. What's UV? Sorry, ultraviolet rays. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. hey, I hate to be a one-issue worrier, but <laughs> what what are your thoughts on the effects of natural gas drilling? Oh as boy, this monstrous oh, thing gets going, and and how far do you think it will spread? They're they're talking about the yeah. basins even going down to uh, you know the bays and so forth. Yeah. Well, frankly, I see it as just a, a massive threat, and I really don't know how much, but just everything I've read about it, you know, the water that they need to do it, the, uh, the fluids they use to, to use, which are not known because they're proprietary, but they evidently contain nasty things. Um, maybe not in huge amounts, but they contain them. And the fact that these, all the drilling has, you know, they, they'll deforest a couple couple of acres and then build connecting pipelines. All of those things are going to mean a, a fairly massive uh, habitat degradation. And I might point out one thing, point that I didn't get to, and I, don't want, to, I don't want to keep answering questions, but um, the issue of fragmentation. You know, you say, well, we can preserve, you know, um, maybe even a square mile here of the, of the original habitat, which let's say occupied a thousand square miles, okay? <coughs> But the problem with fragmentation is, first of all, it doesn't support some things like top predators, like the ivory bill I mentioned. That can only survive if it's got at least six acres. And that isn't a viable population. If you want a viable population, which is often considered up around 500 individuals, then you've got to have 500 times six acres. So, um, sorry, six square miles. 500 times six square miles. And, um, also, fragmentation, they're very vulnerable to things like uh, actually small predators, raccoons, skunks, cats tend to patrol around edges. And uh, so if you've got a small area, it's going to have a lot more edge to it. You know, if you've got ten small areas instead of one big area, you've got a lot more edge. And they found in the tropical rainforests that the winds actually, even though they're not that severe in the tropics, the penetration of winds into forest will essentially lead to the extinction of species within about, um, I think about half a kilometer, half a kilometer of the edge, which is what, about a third of a mile. Uh, you get extinction of certain species because it simply gets too dry uh, for them. So, so fragmentation is not a solution. It's a partial solution. If we can't do anything else, let's save a little bit. But uh, you really need to save sufficiently large tracts to uh, to keep the uh, keep the systems intact. Yeah, you know, you know, one of the classic problems you ever study and you do a math is uh, the predator prey problem and the cyclic nature of that. Right. Given the fact that there is no doubt a a top predator that exists in the country, in the world today that is extremely intelligent and taking over everything. <laughs> that beside the point, and that there is no doubt that. That plays a lot into the you know the loss of biodiversity though, but species come and go as you pointed out naturally. Right. What is the you know right balance of letting you know, you know certain species need to you know whoa that just naturally pass away and things like that? Do you expect that all species need to be preserved? What is the balance uh, there? What is um, the I don't think we need to worry about if all of them will preserve because they won't be. But um, uh, what's the balance? That's a political, economical, historical, <laughs> biological, <laughs> geological question. So um, I, I would just say, let's save as much as we can. And uh, um, actually, my last point that I think I'll make when I was talking about what can we do, 
is um, we can examine our personal lives <laughs> and uh, ask questions like, is the wood that you're building that shed of, did that come from a sustainably forested logged place? Probably not unless you got it, I forget what the certification is called. Does anyone know? Forestry, uh, do you know Chris? There are several of them, some of which are <coughs> greenwash. Right. <laughs> so you really have to be careful in the certification you look for. Yeah. But anyway, you can do that kind of thing. You know, think about the food you eat and, you know, does it come at the expense of 3,000 miles of transportation costing and how is it raised, you know? I'm afraid if you do eat uh, uh, pork, 99% of pork around here comes from these intensive uh, commercial uh, feeding operations that are, are massively pollutant and actually not very good for the animals either. But, uh, you know, so what I'm saying is uh, sort of ex examine what you eat, what you use, and ask the question, is this sustainably produced? Chickens, too. Should have chicken for that. Chicken, yeah. No, uh, True. Real problem is stay oh, fish. fish. Yeah. Well, well, this last question is actually what I would talk when I ask about is it the basic problem that we got too damn many people in the world? I, yeah, I'm afraid Nobody so. Nobody wants to leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, David Pimentel, who's a famous Cornell um, ecologist, who is famous for having done a lot of sort of big studies of, you know, what what is the amount of energy that humans use. He thinks that, um, he was saying that, well, uh, maybe about a billion people is sustainable on Earth. And I was talking with Dick, I think it was earlier, he was saying something like two, two billion, two and a half billion. Uh, certainly I'm afraid not six and a half billion, which is what we have now, or the 10 billion that's forecast. So something's going to happen. Well, birth rates are going way down. But. Yeah, uh, I forget the name of the person that we had here is folks at the university, but the folks, the big name environmentalist. And one of the statements he said, he said he didn't really think that individuals changing their lifestyle mm -hmm. would have a really significant impact on what they were trying to achieve. In other words, that, yeah, you just mentioned, you know, we can change our lifestyle. But he really felt that you really had to have radical change in the systems themselves, yes. that individuals really couldn't do a lot just by changing their own individual lifestyle. But you just made that statement, so I want to know if you really believe it. <laughs> <laughs> do I believe it? Uh, the problem, George, as I'm sure you're aware of, is that uh, um, is getting it to take hold, you know. And us, we optimists, always think, well, you know, if we can just spread the message. And I think you would agree that we just, as with your uh, many peace activities, that, uh, you know, we just do what we can and we spread the message as widely as possible. And I guess in that connection, I did have one final thing that we can do, and that's education. Uh, you know, just educate as many people as you can in whatever way you can about maintaining a sustainable environment, and particularly with relation to my lecture, maintaining biodiversity. Um, whether we can do that or not, uh, I would say, well, we've got to. <laughs>